Thank you, brother. Now, if you were to ask me, Brother Tony, how many points have you got this morning? Then I'm going to tell you I've got one point. i got one point to make. i got one emphasis and just one message. Now, our theme is what Christ has done in our behalf. He has done for the Father. He has done it for the Father in our behalf. Now, I want to start in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. And you know, if you're familiar with uh, Isaiah, particularly that latter part, the last 26 chapters in particular, you'll, you'll, you'll know when I say that what a tremendous, what a mighty declaration is that chapter 42 when it begins there. And in, in, in God uh, inserts these wonderful things about something that's going to take place in the future. Now, uh, he is actually dealing with, beginning somewhere uh, in probably 40th chapter, somewhere there, uh, he is dealing with the promises God's going to make about releasing his people from Babylonian captivity. But right in the middle there of these promises, he inserts this wonderful truth. And you know, it actually goes back to the 40th chapter as a word of comfort to the people. Where he says, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And the blessing at that point has been committed to God's people. Beginning with the first verse and the 40th chapter, then the, the, uh, the complexion of Isaiah changes dramatically. And he says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street, a bruised reed. Shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench? He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his laws. Now, you skip down to verse 8 and 9. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things I do declare. Before they spring forth, I'll tell you of them. So this morning, let's look there in Isaiah, and let's behold God's servant. Let's stir the hearts about this servant of God and what, what he has promised to do for his people. He has set judgment, righteous judgment, on the earth in truth. And he has done so in the context of loving kindness. A bruised reed he shall not break, and the smoking flax he shall not quench. In the end, brethren, in the end, when God comes in flaming fire, after the shaking away of all those things that can be shaken, the servant, will, the servant of God will have shown God to be in loving kindness and judgment and righteousness. That's the way we'll see him. Now, I want you to listen this morning to Jesus because our text is taken from the 17th chapter of John, the fourth verse. Now, I want you to listen to Jesus as he speaks to the Father. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. This verse is taken, as you know, is taken from the longest prayer in the New Testament. It's actually the parting words of our Lord. The Lord of glory, the only begotten Son, the eternal Son with the Father, has come, no doubt, he has come, no doubt, to the most severest time he'll face on this earth. However, his prayer, you know, is not absorbed about thoughts of himself. This prayer, he is praying not for his needs. And so Jesus, not, Jesus does not pray silently to himself. But rather Jesus prays aloud in behalf of his disciples. And for all those who would believe on their word. He prays out loud, out loud so his disciples can hear him. So we have this marvelous record for our blessing. And as far as the prayer is concerned itself, you'll notice the, I, I noticed my, uh, the vocabulary in this prayer is easy and simple vocabulary. Now, what Jesus is saying is not simple. I'm not saying that because, you know, we'd, we'd hardly ever fathom the depths and the, and the insightful meanings that uh, Jesus uttered in this prayer. We'd have to have these things opened up to us in the Spirit. We know that. But what I mean by easy and simple is that the, the prayer is clear and direct and easy, and easy to follow. And what makes this prayer, and this is one of the things that makes this prayer so sublime and so grand. And also, it's to who it is that's praying. 
Okay. And who it is that Jesus is speaking to. Uh, it's the beauty of it. It's, it's, we're allowed to see somewhat of the, the relationship and of, of the glory of the Father and the Son there. And he expresses it out loud for us. Amen. Our interest really in this prayer is driven by who it is that Jesus is speaking to. We want to know what Jesus said to the Father. So do take note, brethren, what the Lord has to say is absolutely the final summation of what he's done. This prayer is kind of like a wrapping up of Jesus' earthly ministry on the earth. It's an account of the completion of his work here, what he's done. What Jesus is saying now, he's not just saying to mere men. This is, he's given a, a summation to, to the Father. The tone of Jesus' words. You can read, you can pick up the tone in the message. They sound decisive, don't they? And they sound final. Uh, they have a sound of completion about them. It's a, it's a, it has a completed sound. We understand that Jesus has no reason to stay here any longer. Then it, then it took for him to complete the work. Then he is ready to go back. He's a, man, he's, a, he's a man of purpose. So even in this prayer, you'll know he refers to himself as though he was no, no longer here. He says in verse 11, and now I'm no longer in the world. So this prayer is to the Father, isn't it? And you'll notice that if you think about it, this prayer is really about the Father. Yes. The underlying issue throughout this prayer is the Father. Jesus finalizes his work just like he began his work. He, fin he began to work for the Father and he finishes it for him. Early in his ministry, he made it clear right off the bat. He came to bear witness of the Father. I come in my Father's name. What the Son saith the Father do, these doeth also the Son likewise. As I hear, I speak. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Why? Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. This is the foundation which Jesus builds immediately. This is then how we should understand that the coming of the Son uh, into the world was primarily for the will of the Father. This is the real reason Jesus will speak, okay? Cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead. That being, I seek not my own glory, but that of the one who sent me. During the ministry of John the Baptist, you'll remember this, in, resp in response to the darkness of men, in, a, in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, we've already alluded to this scripture several times uh, in this meeting. He says, Jesus says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and to he to whomsoever the Son will reveal it to him. In the next two verses, which we're more familiar with, Jesus calls men's attention by saying this, Come unto me. And ye that labor are heavy laden, and I will give thee rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. He says, I'll give thee rest. All ye that labor and heavy laden. Now, we already made point of this. That Now, does Jesus mean if I come to him, I'll no longer have to labor? And if I'm heavy laden, we'll come, to, we'll come into Jesus, take all this away? Well, it depends on what you mean by labor and, and, uh, and how it is that you mean uh, heavy laden. Now, we know this is not a plea from Jesus to solve our daily problems, not, for, not from such things that we can do ourselves, but rather it's a call to safety and salvation and from things that are beyond us. Jesus is calling Amen. from the burden of sin and guilt. Now, in verse 27 that I just read, all things are delivered to me of my, of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Now, that's connected to these two verses. You understand? He's saying these things in the context of this. In view of what Jesus says, and it makes known that no man knoweth the Father but the Son. The emphasis then is, uh, come unto me and learn of him. Okay? So he's, this, this is crucial. We see that he, he, brings, he sets his context, then come learn of me. So he calls it's not about Jesus at this time. It's about the Father. For I know the Father. And I can give you rest for your souls. Blessed is the man, remember he says, who hungers and thirsts after, after God, for he shall be filled. And Jesus has sent, been sent from the Father to do that very thing. He fill men with righteousness. 
we learn from Jesus the manner of God. The Son has come to show us the Father. John says of him, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. So John is telling the brethren, only Son can, can, can declare the Father and make him known, because only he has seen the Father. At the Feast of the Tabernacles, now, in response again, to the Jews' ignorance of who Jesus was. This was later in his ministry. Jesus answers the crowd with, uh, uh, about questions about himself. He answers the crowd. And he says, but I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Jesus declares his own superiority here, his own superior testimony of the Father. It's what he's declaring. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man that therefore hath come and heard and hath learned of the Father hath cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen him. The all there, the all that shall be taught are those who come to Jesus. You know, you know that. All of them shall be taught of God. As to those who are taught of God, the Father must draw them to Jesus. For no one can, no one can come to him unless the Father draws him. And brethren, we know that who God is calling to him, who God is drawing. He is drawing his people. He is drawing the people of God to him. Who are the people of God? Well, then Look, see who God is drawing to himself through Jesus Christ. It's the family of God. They are the ones that the Father is giving to the Son. And it's for the purpose of teaching them and preparing them for glory. And so the amount of what's been said... Here, if someone comes to Jesus, then it's because God has drawn him Amen. and that because they belong to him. We can conclude, and we can make this conclusion about this. We can look around and we can see brethren who are faithfully enduring, standing firm, holding on, increasing profitability in the spirit. They've been given to Jesus Amen. because we know that the Father, we know that the Son Loses none that the Father has given him. Now, on the other hand, those who refuse Christ, they refuse to be taught by God. Now, you know, uh, refusing Christ is a, is a rather delicate matter with the Spirit. The Spirit will not work with any other emphasis than Jesus Christ. He, he just won't teach a man. Now, John also says, But as many as received him... To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, everything that God has for man comes through Jesus because God is making himself known through him. Now, when looking for God, we should look nowhere else but in Jesus Christ. For Jesus is the exact image of God, the portrait of him. He told Philip, you remember, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, this is more than an acknowledgement of his own divine nature, you understand. It is true that Jesus is divine, but this verse has much more to say than this. This statement is a call to understand and see that the Father and Jesus are one. And then there's more. The Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. They are in complete agreement. The words that Jesus speaks comes from the Father. His message comes from God. It has authority and power. All these things are inherent in, what he, in, in that statement to Philip. In this matter with Philip, though, however, Jesus' concern is not Philip. So much understand he is one with the Father, and he is deity as the Father. The point Jesus is making is the Father. It's about the nature of the Father. It's about the Father's goodness, wisdom, and power. Philip, don't you see the Father in me? Don't you see the Father in me? That's what he's asking me. If not on the basis of what I say, but what I'm able to do. What's important to Jesus is the words he speaks to his brethren, that the message is received as having come from the Father. The words I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. See how emphatic what Jesus was about making sure that you see the Father in him. That Jesus is equal to the Father is not the point Jesus is making. Disciples are being exposed to the Father. 
This will be a very significant point in his prayer later on in John 17. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given of me are thine. For, thy, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. For they have received them, and have known surely that I came from thee, and they have believed that thou didst sent me. Now Jesus could say to the Father that the men you've given me have been taught of God. This is quite a unique testimony that Jesus is giving. If you'll understand, uh, it's a testimony to the timeless word of God. Now, we, uh, we read these words today in the scriptures. But uh, these are words that were given about Jesus more than 2,000 years ago. They were written down for this very time as a testimony to Jesus. The word of God transcends time. And we can look back and to this day of Isaiah, when the, when the prophet would prophesy these things about the coming Messiah, about Jesus Christ coming. And he would say in, in 45, of, of 40, chapter of 5th verse, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. See, Jesus is fulfilling these scriptures, the timeless nature, the word of God. Now, we consider, uh, consider also... Incidentally, that uh, these words were spoken about immediately about the context of uh, 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 Babylon being delivered out of captivity. A captivity they haven't even begun yet, and uh, that was uh, would be several hundred years later. And then there was a, the time of captivity. So uh, uh, Isaiah is prophesying something that has happened yet, even in, uh, even considering the captivity. So you know we have the message of God. And beginning way back in Isaiah, Isaiah, where he says, Behold your God, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And that's the whole theme of Scripture, is divine deliverance. Behold, the Lord will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall flee his flock. Feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom, and he shall gently lead those that are with young. So now, brethren, whether it's Babylonian captivity or whether it's an ultimate deliverance, our spiritual deliverance in Christ, or even if it's when uh, Israel is delivered in latter times or unto the time when we're finally delivered from this earth, deliverance is centered in Jesus Christ. It's the Father's Messiah. His deliverer. And it remains to be, always be the deliverance that God has promised. So we say blessed is the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Luke in his gospel account, he will quote for this scripture in Isaiah 43 and 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And he will reference this when he says and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And you know, this is, a, this is a scripture that John the Baptist will use, prepare you the way for the salvation of God. And this is a salvation that the prophets have spoken of, the promised salvation, which God had been anticipating to bring when he saw there was no intercessor and he saw there was no man and, and he wondered. Therefore, his, his strong arm brought salvation and his, his, his own righteousness sustained him. We have in our possession then the record of the Father's Son. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a record that God would do, that he predestined, predestined, predetermined and predestined to do before the foundation of the world. Now, it's recorded in Revelation chapter 5 that John saw in the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. And uh, he saw a book in his hand. And a strong angel came forward and proceeded in a loud voice to call for someone worthy to open the book. You remember this wonderful word. And we read where John wept because he realized there was no man on the earth, under the earth in heaven who could open the book. And the elder said, uh, weep not for the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has prevailed to open the book. And, lo, and, and then it says, and lo, I looked and beheld in the midst of the throne and stood a lamb as it had been slain. And he came and took the book 
out of the right hand of the one who sat upon the throne. And then I'm reminded of that scripture in Psalm 40. Then said, I lo, I come in the volume of the book it's written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is written in my heart. How perfectly this is stated in the very opening verse of Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which the Father gave him. He says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself and he will show him greater thing, works than these that you may marvel. Jesus has come to show the superiority and the abs absolute sovereignty of the will of the Father. What Jesus says and what he will do will be in strict accord to the, to the purpose and the will of God. My doctrine is not mine, he said, but his who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning this doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak it of my own authority. So looking from Jesus' point of view, we see that uh, it is the Father who is working salvation upon the face of the earth. Jesus is the Father's salvation. And as we are as stated early, all, all the flesh upon the earth shall see the salvation of God. Jesus declares that God sent his Son into the world to save the world. Paul said it would be Christ reconciling the world unto himself, that God would be in Christ doing it. Now, when we study the record about Jesus Christ and we dedicate ourselves and our hearts to mind, to his, to his words, to his, to his doctrine, who is it that Jesus really wants us to see? And who is it that Jesus really wants us to know? Well, he's a, his, it's a father. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that this commandment is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Now, in the garden, under difficult circumstances, we can only imagine what they were. Jesus has come, has come to the time when he will lay down his life as a ransom for many. He will purchase redemption and to take the sins of the world upon him. It is here in the garden that Jesus prays then, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, it's always been this way, but as thou wilt, the will of the Father. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now we expect this to be the prayer of Jesus then, doing the will of the Father. And this is the reason he would lay down his life. You know, you must understand this. And you know, uh, it's, it's, this is a good time to say something about the will of God, isn't it? Seeing as it's such a, a superior thing in the mission of Christ. Um, and it's really up to us, brethren, to declare this, the will of God. Jesus was a testimony to the will of the Father, his sovereign will. In all of Scripture, it's a testimony to God's will. There's really no talk about the will of anyone else in the Scriptures. Jesus didn't talk about his own will. Any time a phrase such as thy will is used in Scripture, why, it's always reference to God. I'm talking about the Father in this, in this instance. It's what God wanted to do. There's no such talk in the scriptures as man's will or um, such as I will and, and, and your will and I, I will to do this and things. Uh, a couple of times I think my will is used, but it's always in reference to the Father's will or, or um, in an effort to, make, uh, to comply to the, with the Father's will. Uh, there's no mention of scripture to a phrase that is even similar. I, to man's will. You could catch me afterwards if you can find one. My will is used a few times, but it's in contrast to the will of God. It's always as opposed to the will of God. I, I said the emphasis of Scripture is what God is doing. It's according to his desire. And then it's being made known through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we have a good scripture in 2 Corinthians 2.14 where this very point is being opened up. That Christ is the means by which the riches of God's grace will be made known, not only in this world, but in the world to come. It will continue to be this way. It's here in two, uh, 2 Corinthians 2.14 that Paul refers to the knowledge of Christ as a sweet savor of God. It is one who knows Christ that God is pleased with. Uh, let me read the verse. Now thanks be unto God 
which causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest to savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now men may place emphasis on many things, and they do. And as brethren, one another, we may place many different emphasis, even salvation, concerning salvation, matters of salvation. But as the saints of God now, it's only right, if we want to please the Father, that is, that we make much of his Son in this regard. As the Father is pleased with Jesus, so are we. It stands to reason that the Father is well pleased with him, and those who are very aware of Jesus are pleasing to him. And this is the means... And this is the means, or this is the way we express our satisfaction and our pleasing with Jesus is through the preaching of the gospel. As opposed to something else we could get up here and talk about, is what I mean. It is by the gospel men are brought into, this, into the kingdom of God. And it's by this same gospel by which men, you and I, we reach maturity in the things of God. It's, it is, this is the ministry of the body, the building up through edification. By the word of God, and it this is centered in Jesus Christ. And it's all about till we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Ephesians 4.13. It's all being done by faith in the Son of God through the message we've been given of him. Amen. So then we take note to what Paul says. It is God who is making manifest the knowledge of Jesus Christ in every place we go. This is a spiritual understanding that God gives us. It's contrasted to any kind of other thing. It means that uh, we can't learn it. We can't accomplish it on our own. Uh, it's, men can't give it away. So we shouldn't seek to accomplish it or get it from them. The Father is made known when preaching is centered in Jesus Christ. When the Son of God is the focal point of all the things we got to say. Then will a God be, uh, be done, and then will he be pleased. You know, if the will of God in us is desired above all things, then you'll hear Jesus saying, come unto me. You know, when it dawns on a person, when he's loaded down, and he wants to be pleasing to God, and, and it's different, then he'll hear Jesus saying, come unto me. Now, in regard, and because of this, it's, uh, the way it is. I believe that any moment, anything, or uh, it, it could be an event, an action, what we speak, anytime our, anytime our attention is then pulled away from Christ, then I think, gee, I think the Father loses interest at that point. I think he's no longer interested in what is going on there. No matter how good it might be and, and how important and, and, and all these kind of things, I think fa the Father will lose interest in that. I, can, I think you can just really say it just that way, that plain. Uh, because, you know, without God, nothing can be done. So we want God to be interested in what we do. A sweet savor of the knowledge of Christ. It's the same thing as saying uh, learning of Christ. In Ephesians, where Paul says learning of Christ in Ephesians 4. It is a God-ordained way of learning the Father. When the Lord appears with his mighty angels... He will take vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So on that final day, those who will be found pleasing to God will be those who know him. Amen. This will be the blessing, brethren, in that day, knowing God. Amen. That will be the blessing. All things we need to know are found in God. We cannot have moral goodness. Can't do it on our own. Can't live good on our own. Uh, without the knowledge of God. There are things that are impossible with men. There are things that cannot be accomplished out of our own riches. Things that cannot be seen through our own wisdom. Things that cannot be seen in the strength of our own will. No matter how much you know you want to, you want to see it. We face many things that exceed our abilities. And in addition to this, we talked about it last night. There are, there are forces that are greater than us. that are actually opposed to us. They're in opposition to us. And those who continue outside the knowledge of God, they just don't know what they're up against. They have no understanding of their true condition. Uh, the world is confusing to them. They don't understand. Uh, they remain, and, and, and all the while they remain objects under the rule of darkness. They're confounded by the nature of this world. 
they are. And yet, isn't this the very place that we come from ourselves? But by the mercy of God, we have been delivered from that place. He's put us in a high place in Christ Jesus, brethren. He has given us the understanding that we may know him who is true. Our capacity to know. God has given it to us. We can't develop it. We can't learn it. When we are born again, it starts there. You know, if Jesus explained it to Nicodemus way back there in John 3, it's when we're released and delivered from the bondage of Satan, as Brother Aaron spoke about last night. Then we're, we're put into the freedom of Jesus Christ. We experience newness of life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. We become partakers of that divine nature. It's something God does. He's doing this. That's why we, we can put on the new man, which is created after God in righteousness and true holiness. That's, that's how we can do this when we're exhorted to put him on. You know, as we grow in our, in our judgment and our perception of spiritual life and as our knowledge increases, we see that it's by God's design that the trials of faith and tribulations increase so that the intensities of our trials and our tribulations, they say, kind of move us along so we can extend ourselves into the grace of God. And scriptures express it this way. Scripture words, that we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. For it is in the knowledge of God that grace and peace are given. Jesus has come to give us this knowledge of God. And certainly, this is why Paul would exhort the brethren to throw down and cast down imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself against, against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Now, you saw the connection between, in that verse between the knowledge of God and the obedience of Christ and faith. Having a knowledge of God is so critical that the apostle Paul will say, his divine power has given everything we need for life and godliness through the full knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellent. Now, when you lay all these things out before us, then we can see how, how a serious a matter it is for the world and, and for us too, brethren. Amen. You're familiar with this verse, First John 5, 20. I wanted to read this for you. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Now, you want to put this verse in the context of the preceding verses. Okay? We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that the wicked one toucheth him not, and he knoweth. And we know that we are God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. That's just the same scripture together. Four times in these three verses, Apostle John says, we know or we may know. To whom is the apostle speaking? Well, he's speaking to those who are in Christ. That's what he says. They are the ones who had the knowledge of God. And the subject matter he's talking about is sin. John says those who are born of God do not sin. And the reason he gives is that Satan can no longer access that part of the man who is born again. It's a new creation. It is the one we put on. It's the divine nature we are partakers of. It's that part of us that's one spirit with the Lord. This is knowing God through Jesus Christ. This is the understanding that Jesus has come to give. We're not simply given the word of God and we're supposed to figure it out on our own. I used to think that. No, we have been given a heavenly teacher. One sent from God, Amen. and he teaches us that the whole world lieth in wickedness. But the saints, uh, we sit in heavenly places with him. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, Jesus is absolutely correct in this statement. He has indeed glorified God. Jesus has truly manifested the words and the works of the Father. Jesus can say, I have glorified thee on the earth, and I have finished the work you've given me to do. I have finished the work. 
In particular, Jesus is talking about he has reconciled man to God. That's what he's talking about in particular. I have glorified you means everything that needed to be done to reconcile mankind, humanity back to God has been done. I finished it. It's strict obedience and laying down in his life and by taking away sin. And this is atonement. This means a reconciliation. That's what he means. That's what he's done. Everything concerning salvation, it hinges on Jesus because I finished the work. We're dependent on him, brethren, just as the Father's dependent on him. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is a wonderful statement, this one I just read. It cannot be confined to any particular context or specific meaning. That's why it's timeless. That's why it was spoken way back thousands, thousands of years ago, and it's just as relevant today. It's an all-encompassing truth, complete in itself. It includes all men, and it covers for all time. All flesh shall see the salvation of God in Jesus Christ. The salvation of God is a continuing aspect of the ministry of Christ, is what I mean. John 12, 48, 50. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has something to judge him. The word I have spoken will judge him on that last day because I have not spoken on my own authority. Instead, the Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to speak. And I know what he commands, uh, and I know that he commands brings eternal life. What I speak, therefore I speak, just as the Father has spoken. God has commanded eternal life. And he's given it to Jesus to uh, dispense it to mankind. Amen. He is the head of the body. Salvation for the body comes through Christ. This is his indispensable ministry. It's exclusively his. And it will be accomplished in such a way that it's going to glorify the Father. It's already glorifying him. Jesus has removed himself from the side of the world at this present time. From the casualness of the multitudes, he cannot be found. He is in heaven with the Father. A vantage point, incidentally, that is most effective for him. Jesus glorified the Father, and he's been taken up into glory. So now Christ is with the Father, and we now have access to him, which means he's with the Father. It means we have access to the Father also. All the blessings of glory are ours, brethren. They truly are. All are ours. All that this present time can tolerate is ours. Yet, yet though, they only amount to the first fruits of what is to come. Now, this is the very point in Hebrews 7, that the effectiveness of Jesus' work of salvation is all the more sure because he lives forever. It's a continuing aspect of Christ's salvation. But this man, because he continueth ever, ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, Brother Gibbons says the uttermost, uttermost what? The uttermost extreme that come to him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This shows that Jesus is well able to save us, for he lives forever. And we still, we're still in need, if we're still in need of Christ's salvation. Amen. We're still in need of Christ's intercession. There's still a need for us to lay hold of eternal life. There's still a need to endure to the end for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Now, make no mistake about it. Now, Jesus is able to save all those who come to him. Jesus told the Father in, in uh, John 7, I've kept them. I've kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept them, and none of them is lost except that one. And he can keep you. He can keep you and I as well, brethren. From the same dangers and the perils he kept the disciples, why then he can keep us also. And brethren, we need keeping. Just as disciples needed keeping, we need keeping. As long as we're vulnerable to unbelief and failures, as long as we're in this world, we need keeping. As long as we have, how long? For as long as we have this flesh. For as long as Satan it makes war with those who have the testimony of Jesus, that's how long. That's how long we need the salvation of Jesus. I believe that God has a people according to his own will. God has always had a people of God now. 
preordained and predestined before the world was. The elect of God, holy and elect, they are called and chosen by his will. God knows them by name. He knows each and every one of them by name. Now the question is, do you know them by name? Do you know each and every one by name? Do I know them by name? I, some of them. We are exhorted then to make our own call an election sure. Okay? So that what I mean, it takes a focus off of them and, and puts it on us. We are to assist, however, our brethren whenever and wherever we can in this salvation. So then, brethren, what is the exhortation as I close? Well, Jesus told the Father, he said, I have finished the work that was given me to do. And I thought to myself, now what's the exhortation here? I'm thinking, well, I think it's, a, it's an exhortation to finish then. Since Jesus finished his work, then our exhortation then is to finish the work you've been given to do. I've been given to lay hold on eternal life. So I've been given, I've, that I've been exhorted then by Jesus, haven't I, his example, to finish the work. Yeah. If, yeah. Jesus, if Jesus has bid you come, but you've been slow about coming, then maybe you want to finish the work. Come, come to him, come unto him. He'll give you rest. And this prayer, Jesus said, I have finished. From the cross, he said, I have finished. But you know, Jesus, it's not entirely done. We understand. Because we're not entirely done. Uh, salvation is not complete until we arrive safely on that other side. We have no more done with salvation than Jesus is. But, but then there, there again, there's a very real cause for us to finish the work. What we've been given to do. Now, God will know when we're finished, and he'll take us. But, brethren, my exhortation to you is to finish, to finish what God has given us to do. Thank you, brethren. Amen.